uh, a complex billet made out of some previously welded pattern elements put together. Uh, it's going to get tacked up tonight, and then I will forge weld that all up and re-square it tomorrow. And now it's the very next day. Sorry about the vertical phone video there earlier. Um, every once in a while I will do that without noticing, but uh, sometimes it's irreplaceable footage, so... Unfortunately, you get stuck with it now and then. Try to get better at that. Here I'm dunking this billet in the quench oil tube. And this is um, Glock Quench 50. It's quench oil I got uh, a batch of for cheap, and it actually makes a nice thick carbon jacket. A little better than kerosene, I think. Both are fine. You don't even need any oil to weld. I just like the little added insurance on complex billets like this. Coming out, you can see that my handle was way too light. I had underestimated how heavy this billet had gotten, and all of a sudden, number five rebar was not cutting it. So I had the old bendy handle coming out like a total noob. I need to keep some heavier handle stock on hand. But I tend to run through it and then forget to get more. So now we're just tumbling it back and forth forge welding, kind of patting it all together, not doing too much from one side, constantly looking at the surface and evaluating it for any possibility of anything opening up, pieces that are adjacent being different colors than each other, denoting lack of continuity in the billet, um, listening, feeling through the handle what's going on, and on this one I detected no signs of trouble, it seemed to be patting together nice and solid. So I don't, uh, you know, really forge it too hard or ask too much of it on the first heat here. I just make sure to go over it all very thoroughly and evenly. Keep it uh, n nice and squared up. Don't hit it weird at all. It's always good to keep a hammer on hand right there for quick handle straightening and stuff. Never good to put them back in with a bent handle. So here I had decided to kind of back up my grip with a pair of tongs grabbing it like a stub right near the handle weld. And that helped get it out of the forge without pulling the door off and stuff. Now I'm hitting it a little bit harder. Now that I feel like I'm on my way to a good solid weld, I got a bit of a soak in before pulling it out for the second heat. Got some green growth to aid in um, homogenization of the entire billet. So now we're hitting it, like I say, a little bit harder. And uh, you know, I, if I could go back and do it over again, probably on this one I would have just um, Maybe cut the handle off after this heat and re-weld a stub of something bigger on there, but uh, it was what it was. And the results were okay, but not perfect as you'll see in subsequent clips here. Let me reiterate, there's a lot of things that I will speed up um, for the sake of brevity. I mean, who wants to watch a bandsaw cut for 10 minutes? But I don't plan on ever speeding up any of the forging that I do because, to me, I find it soothing to watch, soothing to do. And I figure if the um, consumer doesn't like watching you know, a full forging heat, why well, you can always just click it ahead with the mouse. But uh, if you're really wanting to learn how to forge by watching this stuff, there's just little cues that you're going to pick up on here and there. Give it another little soak. Third heat here. And uh, with a heavy cross section still, we are knocking the corners down. And we're going for a 45 degree re-square. Forging it on the bias, as they say. 
<laughs> a uh, word to the wise. Trying to get an accurate re-square with a bent handle. Not necessarily going to work the best. Especially when you have the handle end welded on at a specific angle to give you a manual reference point while you're doing it. Well, if the whole angle of the handle is wonky because it's bent from the heat, well, that kind of throws the whole thing out of whack. And regardless, we'll continue forging this down into its new square. For you guys and girls that have been putting up with the hammer bounce in the camera for this long, I can assure you that I have uh, some equipment on the way that will help me deal with this. And I'll share more about it when it gets here. It's shipped today. So I should have a dedicated um, hammer cam that doesn't do this anymore pretty soon. One last heat here to sharpen all the corners, square it up, get everything even and true, flat and square. Always a good idea when you know you're going for a re-square on the next chop up. Now this whole time while I'm forging, I'm typically listening to something in my earbuds. A lot of the times it'll be music. Um, the last several days in the shop I've been going through uh, Brandon Sanderson's fourth book in the Stormlight Archive Rhythm of War so that's a big sweeping fantasy novel about uh, you know, magic and uh, war and love and mental illness and all kinds of crazy vectors so I uh, just thought I'd throw that out there I do recommend it if any of you are looking for a good read and already like fantasy and if you don't like fantasy? Well, hey, maybe, maybe give it a try. It's pretty accessible stuff.
you can see how slowly the bar cools when it's just thick and it's being hit continuously. So although I am coming into having to bandsaw it, I'm not going to worry about subcritical anneals or like a, an oven anneal or anything like that. My experience is, has been that with bars of this thickness, they don't air harden much at all and they will bandsaw up pretty readily as forged with maybe just a little coolant. Today I'm out here working in just a wife beater shirt. Um, it is the first legitimate 100 degree day in the shop. And so, uh, you know, with the forge running, that makes it even worse. Anyway, right now I'm marking up the forged bar uh, for four chunks of equal length. I mark it very carefully. There's a major pet peeve of mine is cutting up bars for a four-way and finding one of them even an eighth inch longer or shorter than the rest, but gosh, I've seen them be a quarter inch longer or shorter than the rest, and that's just its real hard to stomach. Not only is the steel precious, but it just kind of... Uh, it tweaks my, my sort of uh, anal retentive sensibility about wanting everything to be all precise and clean, but I usually avoid that these days. So this was the last cut that this bandsaw blade ever made. By the time I got all, all the way through this one cut, I realized that this was just a whipped, tired old blade in need of retirement. And so we uh, hung it up forever and welded up a new one. See, that's why I'll, I'll fast forward a bandsaw cut. I mean, I think that took five minutes right there. That was ridiculous. I mean, you had to watch it for like 30 seconds, and that was at eight times. So I've cut the bar into four pieces and check etched all the ends. And uh, so we didn't get a perfect re-square. That happens. Um, it happens less the more practice you get and the more careful you are, but it still happens. In this case, I believe what happened was I pulled a rookie mistake and I had used too small of a handle on too big of a bar. And you could see how it bent before. And that really doesn't help you um, with maintaining handle alignment and correctly getting the angle on your re-square. Um, so that just reinforces the lesson to me is just go to a bigger handle size, the heavier the billet gets. A number five rebar ain't going to suffice for a billet that weighs 10 to 15 pounds anymore. Anyway, so if we book match it all, we can make it a symmetrical result here. And it would four way to look okay, but I really want that compass rose look to it as much as possible. So... What I think I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to surface grind these blocks, of course, but I'm going to steer them when I do so that I take, uh, I'm going to shim them up on one side when I grind them so that I can grind like uh, from here across here and then take this corner off too and all the way around so that we are defining a smaller square bar that resides within this square bar. Yes, we're going to lose material. Yes, it's going to be a big pain in the neck, but we want to be uncompromising, at least as much as possible, in the pattern that uh, we wanted to get. And I think that we'll still be able to get that pattern, more or less. 
Um, and then I'll actually be able to bulk it back up again a little bit at least by adding the um, final 15 and 20 cross in between this when I weld it up. So I think, uh, you know, we'll still have a pretty big block of material when we end up. So that's where we're at. Okay, so grinding with a shim. Here's how that's going to go. So it looks like I need to turn these about an eighth of an inch total in uh, two directions to get uh, my points back to how I want them on the pattern. So I need a shim of an eighth of an inch and I'm gonna grind two of these blocks at a time. So uh, these two, for instance, are gonna get ground and I need to grind them right here and right here, but not at the outside corner. So I'm going to shim them up on these inside edges. Uh, and I'm going to then match them so they're well shimmed up together on one side. And then I just so happen to have some 15 and 20 from Alpha that's eighth inch thick by long enough to cover both of these. So that'll be my shim. It's uh, steel, of course, so it sticks to the surface grinder magnet. So what I'm going to do is just stick these to here like this, and then I will grind them until they are totally clean here. The top corner is all going to grind off sooner, of course, and then that'll work its way over to here. And then when I get it clean all the way to here, then I'll stop. And uh, at that point, I should have most of the inaccuracy ground out of my pattern. So there's that. Uh, what I'll do a lot of the time is, since I've propped this up off the chuck a little bit, I've lost some of my stick to the uh, surface grinder magnet. So I'm just going to put a little bit of a catch ahead of this so it can't really kick out and uh, turn on the chuck. Check them. Yep, they're stuck. And lower down to close to the work. And uh, now we're going to have at it. Let me turn my dust collection on. Okay, after a lot of grinding, shimmed grinding on opposite sides and then grinding down the um, odd rhombus shapes created by that, so I got relative squares again. You can see that the points here meet like they should, pretty close there, good there, not bad there, and they're touching in the center. So now I have um, a basic compass rose shape again and now I can put my 15 and 20 shims in here I've lost some mass off the billet it's still pretty hefty but uh, like I said I'm adding a little bit of metal so we'll come back and have a look at this billet once it's all tacked up and uh, we will throw that in the fire and have at it <laughs> 